do your testing. Include progesterone for all women, even after hysterectomy, for at least seven to ten days a month. Or three to five days a week if they've had a hysterectomy and they're not cycling. But I like cyclical. I think it's better. It's just getting them to take it the first ten days out of every month. Uh, low dose, there are some women that are sensitive to progesterone, don't feel good on it. Well, you can hold off or give them very small doses, but they really feel bad. I, I, don't, I can't prove that that's going to do anything dramatic for them. Um, monitor levels of the hormones replaced at least every three months until they're stable. Do some kind of monitoring. It will really help you understand where you are and where your treatment, where the FSH, how you're doing, and also how the paradigm is changing over those years when there's dramatic changes happening and the ovaries failing. The maturation index, that's the one I told you about. You know, increase in phytoestrogens, I think, for women, you know, getting them to have some soy milk and so on. I don't think that's a good replacement. But for women in this kind of borderline range where you're trying to fill in and keep the active estrogen receptors, uh, uh, soy milk or whatever can, can really be helpful. Uh, I kind of jokingly say, uh, you know, the black cohosh and soy is great if you're a geranium. But uh, it's not for full replacement, but it does have estrogen uh, receptor. And some studies seem to indicate those phytoestrogens are actually important modulators of inflammation and other things. So uh, I just don't, some women want to do it all natural with these things. That's why I say, you know, it's good if you're a geranium, but not if you're a woman needing full estrogen replacement. Some people do the testing around period time. I don't think that's a good time to be testing. That's a low. But maybe FSH is a little higher during that time or something. I'd, I'd, I'd rather see where they are in this kind of the, the stable luteal phase. Day 17 to 21 is a good time to kind of get that to see if they're ovulating. Your progesterone levels are going to be very low if they're having ovulatory failure, or what I call that luteal phase defect. Uh, or they're not ovulating at all. As, uh, test, the progesterone levels will be low. FSH should be below 15. You know, it, it really shouldn't be surging. It surges at mid-cycle. Mid-cycle peak, it may go up to 20. But if you're looking for early ovarian failure, you'll start to see FSH levels bumping up above 15. And even the experts will say, you know, if it's above 15 at that phase in the cycle, ovaries beginning to be resistant to the FSH, and FSH is rising. Yeah. Uh, well, you've you got a very complex patient. Let's stop the breast cancer and take the ovaries out. Well, okay. Now, is there any reason to measure your estradiol and your progesterone? You might want to measure ovarian androgens and testosterone just to know about that. Uh, you're getting a little estrone. If they're very heavy and they've got a good DHEA, they may be making estrone, so you may want to measure estrone levels. There's no reason to measure estradiol. It's going to be low and they're going to be having deficiency symptoms. Uh, you really want to measure those women after you treat them. I think you're wasting money by testing for something you already know is deficient. You want a baseline, you can do it, but I think you'll find that estradiol is non-existent or very, very low. And estrone depends upon how fat and how the adrenals are. Well, you're, you're walking out into a very dangerous medical legal area but uh, one of the oncologists we know has 50 ladies that she's given hormone replacement to, and she's having, she presented her results at ACAM. And, uh, you know, these are women who are so symptomatic. They said, you know, I don't care if I've had breast cancer and so on. I'm willing to live a good life and take my chances. And all of them are doing great. So, you know, is that something you can hang your hat on? <laughs> Not yet. So you have to be very, very cautious. Uh, uh, I'd be very careful if they've had a in situ lesion that's curable, you know, a, a little interductal that they got early. I had one like that that had a breast implant. And because of that, it was this tissue was stretched so thin you could actually feel it's just a very slight lump. And it turned out to be a little interductal, non invasive, curable lesion. I didn't have any problem. And even the oncologist said, no, she can have estrogen. But you get somebody with a node positive, sentinel node, and been through chemo, radiation, and so on, man, I'll tell you what. Uh, you've got to have a patient that wants it more than anything legal, and, and that's a patient that probably you should call one of the oncologists that's doing this and refer, refer them out.
I think you, unless you know exactly what you're doing, you're really good at it, uh, you're in medical legal limbo. Even with all the, you know, you can certainly put them on vitamin D and all the things, the selenium, things that you think are supportive, but that's an area. Now, prostate cancer in men I feel more comfortable with. If they've been stable and you can monitor PSAs and, and it doesn't turn the burn on with those people and you can always stop and they seem to be more treatable if you withdraw testosterone after they've been on it. So I basically do a profile on them in that luteal phase. Testosterone, again, total and do your SHPG. I don't think that the free levels are measurable in women that are reliable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know the lab, but if you talk to the experts, they say it's a, it's a very poor, repeatable quality test. So I think, yeah, I think you can kind of do it in your head. When you're talking about ranges, you just want to know, in general, if their SHBG is real high, they don't have as much bioavailable, duh. Do you really need a number? No, they've got no libido, they've got bone loss, they've got muscle weakness and so on. They're androgen deficient. You're going to treat them, and where are you going to follow them? You're going to follow them with your total testosterone probably. And you can kind of get an idea of how high that should be relative to the amount of estrogen you're giving her and the SHPG. So you can give them a little more if their SHPG is higher because you know a lot of it's going to be bound. I think you only need global, global things. You don't need a number. That's why I think a lot of that's expensive testing. And if that lab does it at a very low cost, I wonder if they're really doing extraction and careful free measurements at that level. They're giving you a number, but how reliable is it? Most of the experts say it's not, it's not being done very reliably. And Frank maybe can uh, comment on the intralaboratory variation of hormone measurements and uh, the technical aspects and how difficult it is. Anyway. I do ballpark stuff, stuff that makes sense to me. You can do it in your head. You don't have to have all those numbers. I do a DHEAS, not the DHEA. I talked about that. I do the free T3 and TSH, and I do the vitamin D. It's kind of screening. You can do other things. You can do insulin testing. You can do an insulin sensitivity test, do a one-hour postprandial blood sugar and insulin, see if their insulin is through the roof after a normal meal, or you can give them a glucose uh, feeding, you can do hemoglobin A1Cs, lipid or even VAP fractional analyses, homocysteine, high reactive, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, two f markers of inflammation. Prolactin midday, again, the women can have kind of a suppressed libido from high prolactin. So treat the women and the men the same. This high prolactin is a, you know, something that dampens the response and dampens the libido. You can do a morning cortisol. That's a screening test. If you're going to go beyond that, you can do the salivary serial things uh, that kind of show you the pattern, which is, uh, that's one area where salivary probably is okay. But it's hard to get good sampling, and I, I like the 24-hour profile because it gives you a lot more data to look at. It just doesn't tell you the, the diurnal variation of cortisol. It gives you cortisol and cortisone ratio, very important that the saliva doesn't give you. So... And about three months is the interval I pick. You can pick your own intervals, more or less, depending upon how women are doing, but it takes about that long to equilibrate and kind of make little dosage adjustments as you're going through the doses and women are having more symptoms. They, I tell them, go ahead, if the road signs say you're not covering your estrogen symptoms, go ahead and increase your dose slowly until the road signs tell you stop or back off breast tenderness or kind of excess estrogen symptoms. Uh, so it takes about three months of kind of adapting to the changes, to receptor changes and so on. As they, it may take three to six months to get a woman regulated. You've got to tell them. This is not an overnight thing. Estrogen will make you feel great when it's right. It may take months for your body to adapt or readapt to a high estrogen or normal estrogen status, particularly if it's been deficient for a long time. <clears throat> 